Yo, dude, you ready to watch some Hannibal TV with the one and only, the Sandman? This is Hannibal here from thehannibaltv.com, and I am with ECW legend, the Sandman, who was also in WWE and WCW. How are you doing today, sir? What up? It's early in the morning, dude, and these lights are bothering my eyes. It was a long night last night. <laughs> oh, dude, still, uh, I think I'm still drunk. Yeah, you're still uh, living the life. <sighs> well, it's not, not as, oh, dude, not as much as like back in the day, you know what I mean? Back in the day, we were like rock stars. So. Uh, the older you get, the slower you, you slow down a little bit. So how did you get into wrestling? Let's start there. Um, when I was five years old, I wanted to be a professional wrestler, dude. That's, I never wanted to be like, you know, a doctor, a cop, a fireman, dude. All I ever wanted to be in my life was a pro wrestler. And I used to go to... Um, Philadelphia Spectrum it was back in the day. Uh, the building's not around anymore, and I used to go there every month for and watch um, and watch WWE or WWWF. It was probably like back then, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, like Andre against Big John Studd in the steel cage. Uh, Superstar Billy Graham freaking against Bruno when he kicked Bruno out of the cage and Bruno won. Oh, I was so pissed because I loved them. Uh, Superstar Billy Graham was my favorite dude. And um, and somebody put a fly. So by the time I'm like, I don't know, I'm like 27 years old and somebody, I didn't even know what an indie show was. I didn't know there was other wrestling on the planet because back in the day, you didn't have a fucking computer in your fucking pocket. So I, I just knew nothing except WWWF. And then, so, and then uh, Joel Goodhart, that was um, Eastern Championship Wrestling, he put, a, he put a flyer on my car when I was at the Spectrum, you know what I mean? And then, and, and it was like an independent show. Um, I didn't know any of the guys, but I had to go and check it out. I, oh, I think because they said, I think Bruno San Martino was there. Oh, and the best thing fucking was, dude, I um, when we pulled up to the place, it was called McGonagall Hall in Temple. Temple College is not too far from here. Um, and I, I, and Bruno San Martino is getting out of his car the fucking same time I am, dude. I was like freaking out, you know, because because I'm a mark, you know. We're, we're, the reason why we're here, except you know, some of the dudes, the football players, that you know, I, I can't play football here. I'll try this pro wrestling thing, dude. But um, but uh, I would I just I I even lived it back then, dude. And I'm like freaking. I'm, you got to remember, I'm 27 years old now. I'm not like some some like happy like 14 year old kid that still believes it's real and um and I met Bruno and I went into the show dude the opening match the first two dudes that come out I'm like are you fucking kidding me I could be one of these guys easily gave the dude 3,500 bucks the next day uh the next day and started in and started in his school freaking uh and started in his school like March 6th and by June 9th I had my first match and within a year, I had already wrestled Superfly Snuka, Ivan Koloff, Don Morocco, Jerry Lawler. Like, that, I got so lucky getting taught by freaking dudes that have been in the business. Dude, I mean, it was just crazy just getting that opportunity wrestling those dudes, um, you know, in my first 10 matches. How was Snuka? You, you, you had to keep your eyes open because you didn't know he was touching you. The dude was him, like him, Marty Gennetti, freaking, uh, I were dude, like the, probably like the two lightest dudes I've ever like been in the ring with. If they're throwing a punch, dude, you have to watch because you won't know to sell because they ain't fucking hit you. It's crazy. It was crazy. It's crazy. Those two guys. And you got booked in Memphis pretty early on. How did yeah, you dude, I was in even six months in. Lawler wanted to, because that, that business was freaking dying. The couple months I was there was the, was the dude, I'm wrestling Jerry Lawler in the main event in Evansville, Indiana. This was before Christmas that year. I don't know, like 89. And um, this was before Christmas that year, and I counted 27 people in the audience. <laughs> 27 people in Evansville, Indiana. Dude, we were pulling make maybe like 75 people at the Mid-South Coliseum. You know what I mean? That company was, uh, yeah, it was the worst grossing uh, couple months that they had ever done. And I was working with Law. Dude, I got there. I did, uh, I worked with, um, I worked with Brian. I worked with his son, Brian Christopher. Next thing, dude, I'm not, I'm in the biz, I'm in the business like six months. And next thing you know, I'm freaking, I go to Memphis. And then two weeks later, I'm working on top of freaking Lawler.
Wow. Working main events with Lawler, dude. It was freaking crazy how it just like happened. Were you the Sandman at that point? Yeah, I was a Sandman. I had a I had a wetsuit, a surfboard. Uh, okay, so before I went down there, I used to I used to wear like these lime green pants that had like a I, I don't know I think I designed them with like an hourglass on here, and maybe Sandman down there, black boots. And um, but Lawler wanted two gimmicks. So me and this dude that I started with, J.T. Smith, who I had probably, you know, probably uh, if I wasn't working, if I didn't get lucky and work one of those dudes that I was telling you earlier, it was me and J.T. Smith opening up the show. And um, so he became the he was just a regular, regular dude. So he became the black cat. And he, and he put on and he wore some like man, some, you know, like a cat mask or something. And then so I go to the pit bulls. I'm talking to the pit bulls and because we be, me and those dudes became friends. I'm like, I'm like, dude, what the fuck am I going to do? Lawler, Lawler wants some gimmick. And like and the pit bulls like, I got it. So we get in my van, we drive down to Delaware. The Pimples ran Philadelphia back then, dude. They would have, they knew every bouncer, they knew everybody in every freaking club there was. It was crazy. And um, he, we went down to like Rock Lobster or something on Delaware Avenue, walked, talked to one of his boys, walked up on the, got on the wall, grabbed the surfboard, pulled it off, and he goes, here, bring that down with you. I'm like, it worked perfect. So the Sandman was a surfer gimmick to begin with. Well, yeah, well, not the very beginning, but I needed something for Lawler, so I changed to the wetsuit and I changed to the and I, and I got the surfboard because he wanted some kind of gimmick. So how was the pay there? Oh, the shit! It was like fucking. I was losing money, okay. freaking being there because I was work. I've pretty much been working for myself, you know, my my whole life with my own businesses. Yeah, I was losing money because I wasn't up here paying attention to this, but I needed the experience to be down there, and, that, and that's why I had to roll back. I would have stayed longer, but um, but uh, uh, you're making no money. My wife's trying to run whatever. I think I was doing something with the newspapers back then, and and she had to do that, and she couldn't handle that. So that's why I only stayed down there for like I don't know, maybe like eighty days, ninety days. But the, yeah, the pay was freaking two hundred fifty bucks a week. So is the rumors true that you're actually a successful uh, businessman? Well, yeah, that's what I've done. You know, concrete business. Where I was roofing when I was freaking fourteen years old, dude. Mostly construction. Now I'm doing some real estate stuff. You know what I mean? But yeah, I don't. I don't like. I don't take orders from people. Good. So <laughs> I, I learned freaking early. I got to work for myself. So when you came back here, it was Eastern Championship Wrestling that you joined. What's that? Was, uh, I was there. I Dude, I yeah. never worked for another fucking company until I left for WCW in 2000. Okay. I might have done like, like Good Hard would send me to, uh, like, I, oh, I forgot, put off it. Uh, put off it in the first, in, in my first freaking like three months of fucking working. I worked him in some show in, some show in Connecticut. Good Hard got me a couple of those bookings, but besides the dude, I didn't work. And then once Todd Gordon took over Good Hard, freaking, I, I didn't work for anybody else for years, okay. for 10 years, maybe a decade until I went to WCW. How was Todd Gordon to work for? I was just with him this week. Ah, he's the best, dude. We're best friends. We're still best friends. We talk all the time, dude. Texting every day. And he had you feuding with Don Morocco at first? Well, I put the belt... Todd, I don't know. Me and Todd just clicked from the, from the beginning. Even before... I didn't even know who the fuck... I didn't know that he was an investor in the company. I didn't know that Bob and Lex Ortiz had paid for the belts. So they were kind of investors in the company. I had no idea. I just knew the dude was cool. And we freaking, and we clicked, you know what I mean? Freaking, and um, and then the next thing I know, he owns the freaking company. He calls me down to his freaking store at 10th and South and on Jewelers Row in Philly. And he's like, hack, he goes, I'm going to put the belt on you. I'm like... I'm like, what? I don't even. Oh, Morocco had the belt, and he didn't. I guess he didn't want to keep it because that was the last I ever seen of Morocco there. And um, yeah, so so I was this guy from the from the beginning. That's really the last he ever did in the states. I think I don't, I didn't hear too much about Don Morocco after that. Wow, that would be great to know, dude. I don't. Yeah. It was like 1990, maybe, or 89, 89, 90, one of those, dude. That'd be great if it freaking was one of his last matches in the states. How was he outside the ring? Mm, I was so just freaking juiced. I don't. I don't even remember him in the back. I don't. <laughs> I don't remember talking to him about the match even. Okay. I just remember doing the finish. We're doing powder. It's the first time I've ever done powder, right? Morocco puts me up for that tombstone thing or whatever his finish was. You know what yeah. I mean? Was it a pile driver? He had your face this way. Yeah. Uh, whatever the fuck, whatever it was, he picks me up for that. He spins around peaches. Who was my real wife? 
uh, at the time. She gets the powder and she's supposed to throw it in. She throws it in his face, but she throws it. And and I learned later that you have to put like sugar or salt. You got to be like, you got to be like 50, 60 percent powder, 40 percent like sugar or salt. Uh, Nancy woman told me that one, dude. That's where I learned from. I learned from her later on because me and her used it. And, and I was asking her what she was doing. She's like, yeah, dude. Or I told her we had fucked it up. And then she's like, that's because, you know, you got to put a little weight in there with it. And then, we, and then, so she throws the powder. The powder literally goes like this far. Morocco, like, sticks his face out, goes like this, falls back. And, I, and I'm like, I wish I had that on YouTube to see, to see how ridiculous it was. And you just mentioned woman. What was it like working with her? Oh, dude, she was the best. That lady told me so. Just, that lady told me as much. Um... Uh, of as outside of the ring as I knew like moves inside the ring then you know what I mean she because she had been with Kevin Sullivan for freaking her whole life since she was a kid dude and we and everyone knows how brilliant fucking Kevin is so so she absorbed it all dude and she was just like no hack we're not doing it that way we're doing it like when we I'll give you an example when we did the blind angle when uh <laughs> me and Dreamer do the blind angle, right? And I wanted to do it like the Tommy Rich. Like Tommy Rich would 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 uh, bleed, and he'd be like his face in, and the white hair looked great, and he would jukes hard, dude. And then like freaking like run, like go like this, walking around the audience and shit like that, selling. I said I wanted to do it like that. She goes, No, that's not how we're doing it. I said, why? It'll be freaking perfect. It'll do everybody will see the blood. She goes, dude, we're trying to we're trying to blind you. We're not trying to make you bleed to death. She goes, You're gonna get hit. You're gonna fucking lay there on the mat. And this is how I learned this one, like pregnant pauses. So it's her and Dreamer, and it's like, and it's like, boom, I get hit, I'm down, fucking she looks at me. She looks up, looks at Tommy. Tommy like looks at look looks at her, looks down at me. She looks down at me. And there's little pauses here, you know what I mean? And then they both look up like together, or that's how I remember it, you know what I mean? And it got over huge because they people totally believed I was blind, wow. which you can't even do nowadays. But we were good at keeping secrets, like surprises and stuff like that. All the surprises, I if there was a surprise, I was the one to pick them up at the airport because I was the one that they could trust that nobody else would find out about. I'm like, I remember Steiner and a couple other guys coming in, and I had to take them out to dinner and shit before the show. Were you uh, shocked when she was killed, I guess? Oh, uh, yeah. What are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, dude. I was, oh, dude, that hurt right there. That hurt my heart right there. Yeah, dude, I was fucking devastated. I couldn't move. I was just, dude, Vince got us all together. Um, I'm in, uh, what's that town in Texas on the fucking ocean? Um, I forget what, I'm in Texas. And, you know, there's like 70 of us there. He sits us all down and, and we knew it was going to be the Benoit was dead. And then they hit us with uh, the kid and and fucking um, and Nancy. And I just started bawling. I couldn't move. I was in that seat for another three hours. Everybody else was going or doing whatever. I just, I was so devastated. I, I couldn't even move. Because our family, our sons were the same age. My son, uh, which which one was that? Oh, that was Oliver. I had five sons, so I'm trying to think of like which one it was. And yeah, they were the same age, and, and they and um and they would bring them to shows like the big shows. So fucking our kids would play together, and me and Nancy were super tight. So so obviously she knew because Chris had been in East, uh, he had been in ECW for a long time, but me and him didn't talk. Much, you know, it's like hey dude, how you doing? You know what I mean? But then I guess he figured out. Nancy told him how cool I was, and Chris buddied up to me like right away oh and then i had to tell who did i have to fucking i had to tell who was in the ring oh davy boy was in the was davy boy who somebody oh no that was an owen hart story that was when owen died sorry that was a different story so i forget what i was where the fuck was i <laughs> was with, with Owen Hart dying, you must have been in wcw then yes oh yes and i think davy boy was and nobody wanted to tell him Oh, no, it was, oh, that's it. I'm a freaking idiot. No, it was Chris that was in the ring. All right, so that's the Benoit thing. Chris was in the ring, and, and everybody's phone just starts blowing up. And I, remember, I think it was DDP was the first one to say it. He was like, dude, Owen just fell out of the fucking ceiling, whatever. We didn't know that he was actually freaking, like, dead at, like, right away, but, like, 10 minutes later. Uh, so, and Chris is in the ring, and nobody wanted to tell him. And I had just lost my brother. My brother had died, and Chris knew that, and uh, and um, 
And so I, I was like, dude, no, 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 like, what the fuck? Who's going to tell Chris? I said, I'll tell him. And I told him, I don't even remember the action, just, uh, you know, just astonishment. You're like, whoa, what the fuck? You know what I mean? But yeah, I was the one that had to tell Chris then. So you were close with him? Uh, Chris was cool, dude. I don't know why he liked me, but uh, yeah, he was really cool. And, and you worked with Shane Douglas a lot, of course. Any thoughts about him? Yeah, he was the shits back then. Shane was, look, we're all fucking full of ourselves. And, and uh, dude, me and Shane are cool now. We're really cool. I like Shane. But back then, me and Shane didn't get along. Shane didn't want to lose to me in a fucking championship match. right? And he made, and he made himself look bad. Uh um, because, well, one, I'm, if I'm getting over more than you are, and, you know, you got to understand, so I, I'm, I'm drunk going to the fucking ring. I'm just having fun. Shane's all like fucking, oh, my God, I'm not franchise. You know, him and Taz, like, yo, put your gimmick away, dude, when you walk through the fucking curtain. You know what I mean? That's how those guys were back then. So that's why we didn't get along. And a lot of people didn't like Shane then, and everybody didn't like Taz. So, um, so Shane doesn't want to lose the belt to me because he's going to go do Dean Douglas in, um, in, in WWE, but Shane doesn't want to lose to me. So he came up with some, so oh, this was Nancy again. It was her idea. She goes, listen, and Shane, Nancy didn't like the, like, like it that he didn't want to lose to me either. Cause Nancy was, me and Nancy were clicking hard right here. Dude, we're fucking, she knows we're taking the fuck off. I don't even realize it yet, but she knows my career is going. And, um, and, and so she was pissed off at it. She's like, ah, I got this. So she did something where she, he's got me in, a, he's got me in like some, uh, I don't know, like some like, I don't know, he's behind me and he's like trying to choke me from every stand. She hits him on the fucking calf with the cane. He falls over and I, and I bit him. I'm like, dude, that just looked like total shit. And, and so he didn't want to lose to me, but Nancy was like, we're going to do it this way. She took care of the whole thing and then she came back and gave it to me. I'm like, okay, if he wants to look like shit. Dude, if I'm losing, I want to lose strong. I do not want to lose weak like that. I don't care who you are. And I, dude, and I've lost 90% of my matches. The only time I won is when they had to put the belt on me because freaking somebody was leaving for WWE. And about five times. The, only, the first time was the only planned time. Everything else was happenstance. Somebody's li um, somebody's leaving. Put the frick a belt. I don't even know how I got it. To, who the frick was leaving? How I got it the second time, and then the third time was an act. That was uh, that was an accident. The fourth time was um. Oh wait, who left on the third? Was it Cactus? And then there was it was supposed to go on freaking um. Like it was, it was on me, and Paulie didn't want me losing to Steve Austin, so he has Mikey beat me. Which I, I didn't give a fuck. And then Mo Austin was going to beat Mikey. Mikey beats me. Austin signs with WWE, so I got to take the belt back from Mikey. Shit like that, you know what I mean? It was all. It was the first one was the only one that was like outright booked and planned. The rest was because somebody had the belt and they were leaving. How did you get along with Austin? Um, dude, I, I, didn't, I didn't spend much. I had to spend like much time with him, you know. But he was one of the boys. Okay. Hey, he fit right in the locker room. You know, some you know some guys would come in. Uh, everybody that came in was like, "Wow, this is a really cool locker room." I mean, we we were just just everybody got along, and they were coming from places like like if they had worked for Vince and they know how the fuck it was. I didn't know how it was up there yet, but they all knew that it sucked up there no matter what year it was. You know, so they came into our locker room and they loved it. Whose idea was the cane? Okay, here we go. Um, Paul Heyman's got, uh, Paul Heyman's, uh, uh, Todd hires, hires Paul Heyman to do the book. It's a Sunday afternoon and I, I here, you wanna hear, <laughs> this is how lucky shit is for me. I just happen to be living 20 minutes from where where, where Paul edits all the TV and stuff and, um, and we're, we're like 25 miles. And in fact, I, I live pretty close to there right now. That's, that's funny how it comes full circle. Todd calls me at, um, on a Sunday afternoon and says, Paul wants you at the studio. I have no idea what for. So I, I but I'm very happy. So I roll up to the freaking studio. I roll into the studio, and Ty, and, he, and Paul starts telling me. Paul knew that I was. I liked politics. I knew about news. I knew what was going on in the world. He's like, "You're gonna love this." He goes, "You know that kid, freaking. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you his name in a second. The kid that um, 
He's spray painting cars in Thailand, and then him and a couple of his boys got sentenced to eight wax with a cane. But their cane is not the cane that I have. Their cane is like a cherry tree, and it's wrapped with vines, and it, dude, it fucks you up. So it was big news in the United States that, that this American kid was going to get caned. He goes, so you're going to have a cane. I'm like, uh, okay, see, I'm not getting it yet. I don't see his whole picture yet. You know what I'm saying? I'm just like along for the ride here. I'm like, well, oh, and we're standing outside when we're talking because I'm smoking a cigarette or something. And I'm like, well, what are we going to use for a cane? He's like, Paul doesn't even have this part figured out yet. He's got the whole, he probably got six months in his head, but he doesn't have figured out what the fuck, what's the cane going to be? He looks around, he's like, Walks up to a tree, rips, pulls the branch off the tree, breaks it, pulls the leaves, things off. He goes, wrap some black tape around that. That's what we use as a cane. Well, that was the shits, but we used it for the promo that night. Oh, dude, I would love to see that promo again. So we used that cane for the promo uh, for the promo that night. And then I remembered, at this point, I remembered Tojo Yamamoto. I had seen something with him. Uh, and and he had and he had a cane in the ring. So then I had to figure out how to go find one of them, and I found one in the city at this at this at this martial arts store. But you got to remember, it wasn't easy back then, dude. You had to fucking go in a phone book or something. Yeah, you were just asking your phone, dude. And I didn't even know that it was called a kendo stick. So even that, I didn't even know what the fuck I was looking for. I just know what it looked like. And I, I, I forget how I ended up getting Nobody it. Nobody knew what it was until you started doing it. I know, dude. That's just that lucky shit. You know what I'm saying? Somebody leaves put the belt on a hack. Oh, it's big something in the news. I get a cane that freaking, that's, that I'm known for. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It's like, it's great. Everyone remembers the dreamer thing when you whacked him numerous times. Oh, dude, I beat the shit out of him. But that was understood between me and him. We knew that freaking violence was going to sell. You know what I'm saying? We just, I don't know how, but we just knew, dude, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it hard and we're going to do it good. I, oh, I made him believe with the first shot, too. It was great. And you worked with Cactus Jack, as you mentioned. How was that? Yeah, Cactus didn't like me working because I was, a, by this time, I'm on a roll, dude. I'm a super rock star in it at this point. And um, Cactus didn't like me going to the ring drunk. In fact, oh, but it was poetry, me and that dude, dude, me and that dude in the ring. We, he didn't really like me outside of the ring much. You know, we weren't like boys. You know, Cactus is a different kind of dude. Um, but, um, but in the ring, dude, it was just, it was easy. It was just, it was just easy with me and him. I, 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 I would do most of the call and oh, that, that's do most of my career. I did the call and no matter who I was in the ring with, it was just except like Lawler and stuff like that. But I'm always doing the call. And, um, what was it? Called? Where was I at? Uh, working with Cactus Jack. Oh yeah, working with Cactus. So Cactus calls, <laughs> Cactus calls fucking Todd Gordon, right? Cactus doesn't doesn't really know how tight me and Todd are. So Todd's like right on the phone. He goes, Cactus refuses to work with you. <laughs> Cactus refuses to work with you if you drink before your match. I'm like, yeah, okay. I don't know whose idea it was, me or Todd. But... So I didn't go into the locker room. We're the main event, me and Cactus. I didn't go into the locker room like I wasn't even there. My music plays. I said, make sure I come out to the ring for And obviously I was drinking on the freaking, uh, I remember we were in Briarcliff. Place actually not too far from here. Probably as the crow flies, like maybe five miles or so. And um, and we're out. I'm drinking in the graveyard. Same. Uh, don't say that story hack. All right, there was a graveyard right across the street. So I'm drinking in the graveyard. I always had this thing with graveyards. And um, walked into the ring. I was drunk. I said, "Well, so cactus. I heard you call Todd Gordon. I told the people the whole story. I said, well, I'm drunk. You going to wrestle me? He had to come out then." What's he going to do? Stay in the locker room. So that's how I dealt with that situation. That's and we're, yeah, we're cool now. I had a problem with him in England one time because this dude, that, this, this promoter in England that I, that I liked a lot, uh, hired him. And, it, and the deal was, it, the deal was Cactus, if Cactus didn't get his money by a certain time or something, then the payment doubles. So the dude sent the money in Western Union back then, but what was Nick Foley? But the last name was spelled wrong, F O L E Y, or it, however the spell, the little bit of spelling problem was. So Cactus doesn't get his money for like I don't know, it maybe took an hour to figure it the fuck out. But then he charged my boy double to come. You know what I mean? And I was 
pissed off at him about that. I let him know at the one time. And your feud with uh, Raven, everyone remembers that. Uh, how was that and how was having your family? I learned a shitload from Scotty, dude. Like, I didn't know what a false finish was. I really didn't know what a false fucking finish was. That's how stupid I am when he got a hold of me, dude. And that dude, him and his just, we would do literally in like 85 different spots in a, in, in a match with me and him because he had the mean, he had the booger picking moron, he's got Steve, and I would do spot, we would set up like three different sets of false finishes with each one of them. So that's that's a minimum right there of like 24 moves right there that you have to remember and in a sequence you know what i'm saying and then we sell all the false finish dude i learned so much from that dude because he dude he was real dude he was young enough and he was producing like what they had like a fireworks show or something for vince and he was one of the producers on that show when he was really young so he had a good really great mind for the business too bad he's such a moron now, the crucifixion angle, did you think it was going to blow up as big as it did? No, and the only reason it fucking blew up was because Kurt Angle was in the back. I loved it, dude. I thought it was great. I made that fucking cross. Oh, really? You know, dude, you know what else I made? You know the fucking um, uh, Dreamers fucking scaffold match with Brian Lee? The, yeah. the change? I made that by myself. I put that whole thing together. Cause that's what I do. I do construction shit. So yeah. So I made that. So I made the cross dude. It pulls off and get in the back. I'm like, oh yeah, dude. The silence was deafening in that crowd. So I'm starting to realize that if they're not reacting at all, then it's fucking heavy. So I'm feeling the heaviness of it. I get in the back. I love it. I'm like, yes. And, and everybody's like this. Like everybody that's sitting around the monitor is like this. Next thing I know, here we go. Here's Taz and a sir. Uh, no, Shane, here's another thing with me and Shane. Shane, Kurt Angle, Paul, Raven, me, Todd Gordon. We get in the fucking back, and, and you know, and the funny thing is here that six months later, Kurt's in the WWE, Austin's getting hung on a fucking cross just like we did. Do you think he went to Vince and fucking complained? Eh, eh. But I understand him a little bit then because, you know, people don't do, like, religion was never involved really, like, in wrestling like that in the Northeast, so... So he's pissed. Wow, I said no. I did not want Raven to go out there and fucking apologize, which is their, which was part of their kooky fucking answer. I was like, fuck this, and just walked away. Scotty, do not go do that. He goes and does it anyway, and, and which man, I was like, well, I wasn't mad at him for doing it. You know what I'm saying? He, and he didn't want to fucking do it either, but. That was a shitty out that they can. If you really think about it, it just pussied up the whole fucking thing that we just did. And he really didn't need to say, I, I don't know. I just really disagreed with that one. Bad. I let every single one of them know it too. Fuck that. Fuck all you. He should not be doing that. Kurt was there. Dude. I didn't know who the fuck Kurt was. I didn't care. He ended up getting corrupted in the end anyways. <laughs> You know, it's, yeah, dude, it's just funny, dude. Vince has, had, Vince has got somebody on a cross for six, less than six months later, I'm pretty sure. Now, you were part of this WWE Mind Games ECW invasion. Any thoughts on that? I do. I don't know which one. I've been in that. I've been up there uh, working for him so many different times. You guys, like, came in and it was kayfabe that you weren't supposed to be there. Oh, was this in the spec? Was this yeah. in Philly? Yeah. Uh, here we go. I have no idea this is happening until noon that day or 10 o'clock in the morning. Todd Gordon calls me. He says, meet the boys down at the freaking spectrum. Down at, I, had, I didn't know what the fuck was going on. I'm like, why are we there? Um, we get there. I'm drinking. Ta oh, here's another part of fucking Taz. Taz looks at me and Taz is like, I don't know, I'm fucking joking around drinking him and fucking Perry too. Perry had a little, Perry's cool, but Perry was like, like real like um, tense kind of dude. And I don't know that they think that we're going to go in there. They know more than me at this point. I don't know that we're going in the, and I don't care. I was drinking anyway. But, um, yeah, but those two were assholes because they think that um, that there was going to be a, there could be a fight with this, and oh, and in the meantime, so it's tense. I don't feel the tenseness of it because I don't care. I don't think we're going to fight their fucking locker room, dude. If we're here, we're here for a reason, and Vince is the fucking reason why we're here. So we're going to be cool. They're not sticking us in the front row to fucking fight us, dude. I knew that, so I'm like, you guys are idiots. 
Meanwhile, I don't know that I find out 10 years later or whatever, Tracy Smothers is in their locker room and Tracy's watching what's going on. He sees me spit the beer. Tracy wanted to run out to the fucking ring because Vince didn't smarten up anybody in his locker room either. You know what I mean? So we were trying, you know, that's the great part about it is fucking, is learning how to keep to keep a fucking secret in this business. You know what I'm saying? And um, so he didn't know. So Tracy wants to hit the ring and beat the fuck out of me. And um and then and Ta- oh and Taz and Perry were like they were like maybe thirty yards behind us they didn't come down the ringside but they're like oh they, they were our security in case in, in case anything happened but. and then you came back as as the raw invasion like- yeah when Sabu jumped off the uh, jumped off something and it pushed back and I told him it was going to like they had this like thing that you walked under I forget I don't want to say it was a big R or a big A or yeah. a big W or something he jumped off of it and almost and almost fucking took a face bump because it gave out from under him a little bit I remember that I don't oh and I came out from underneath the bleachers that night yeah yeah, all the WWE people were looking at me like, what the fuck is he fucking doing? As I'm like scurrying underneath these bleachers. And working Because we didn't let them know what the fuck we were doing. Working with uh, Terry Funk at the first DCW pay-per-view. Oh, dude, that was fucking great. Um, oh, dude, I was on that night. I actually just saw that match. I was a fucking... I was really good that night. And, you know, some nights I'm obviously the shits. But, um, yeah, I had a really good match that night. And... um and just the ref just kept telling us to try oh well the best one I, that might have been terry folks first fucking moonsault uh, he moonsaults and he kicks stevie richards so hard right in the head dude almost knocked him out the funk's like you know, hilarious and uh and it's just my i think it was my was it my was it my whatever the ref just keeps telling us go home go home go home and i'm like dude i ain't going home until i get in what we had fucking like the barbed wire with the ladder whatever the f- and i hated it those streamers because those japanese streamer things they threw that on my barbed wire that i had hidden under the ring so when i pull my barbed wire all these streamers are stuck on i'm a little bit pissed about that but but yeah, so I walk through the fucking curtain and, and, and like everybody's like, oh my God, oh my God, we got to hurry. We got to hurry because, you know, time sh- Dude, we literally just got that pin in and then we went off the fucking air. Not on, not, not by our doing, by whoever the pay-per-view company was. Scotty was the only fucking one sitting there like this. I don't even know what the fuck, uh, uh, because Funk, got, Funk might still be out in the ring. You know what I mean? So... So Scotty, I look, I walk through the curtain. Everybody's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And I look at Scotty, and he's just like, he's happy as shit, dude. He has to do nothing. He has to go out there and he's got two minutes to fucking drop a fucking strap. You know what I mean? It, he was loving it that I was using up all that time. He's going to lose because anything he does during that match is no and void because all they're going to remember is Funk winning the belt. So he doesn't give a fuck. I, just, I look at Scotty, I'm like, yeah, we're good. Who brought you into WCW? Um, all right, here we go. We're in, um, we're in Ohio. I want to say, man, I'm going to Dayton Wednesday, actually. So we might have been in Dayton. We did a pay-per-view. Paul Heyman, I remember he paid me. My deal with Paul Heyman at that point in the company was I, I'm the highest paid player. Nobody makes more money than me. So Paul being the idiot that he does, I think we got like, we were getting a pay-per-view check that night. Mine was like 15, mine was like 14,000 and Sabu's was 15,000. And I found that, I found out about it right before I left for the show because I was driving to Cincinnati to stay there for a flight or whatever. I called up Paul, I left him, I told him I quit. Done, uh, because I knew in my back pocket kind of knew in my back pocket that I could easily get a job in WCW. So but so I call up, it's like 10.30 at night or 11.30 at night, I'm by myself on the road. I quit, I tell Kai, I, I, Todd doesn't have much to do with the company here at this point or whatever. I'm telling Todd I'm quitting. He goes, no, you shouldn't quit yet. Next morning, oh, I thought I'm living in Utah. Oh, that was a Sunday. So the next morning, the next day is a Monday. I had met DDP. At, uh, Raven took me to DDP's birthday party, one of his birthday parties in Atlanta. Me and DDP hit it off so well at his birthday party. His wife was pissed. Who was his gorgeous wife? Kimberly. Oh, my God. What a gorgeous lady. What a nice, nice, nice chick, too. But she was mad because he was spending so much time with me. And then, um, so... I get DDP's number. I'm in Salt Lake City. I get DDP. I get DDP's number. Um. Uh, oh no. 
I didn't, I didn't have DDP's number. I was going to meet DDP. This is how, this is how the story goes now. I find out from fucking, I call Scotty, and I find out that fucking they're in, um, in Wyoming that night, and I forget what freaking town or whatever, they were in Wyoming, and I'm in Salt Lake City, so they all fly Delta, so they had to go, I don't know this, I just booked myself a flight from Salt Lake City to whatever freaking town they were going in Wyoming, Casper maybe or something, so I'm walking down the stairs freaking, uh, I'm walking down the stairs in the airport in the airport in the airport to go to the WCW show to try and get a job. I walk up, I walk down, and here's here's Rick Rude, who, who me and him were cool as shit with, because he would ride with me whenever he came into the ECW. He was always in the Sam Man van. He's standing there talking to freaking uh to DDP. I'm like, yo, boys, what's up? There? You know, what, what the fuck are you doing here? Well, I was coming to get a job. I quit ECW. DDP looks at me and goes, dude, you told me like six months ago at my birthday party that you would never leave that company ever. That's what he said. I said, well, I don't remember saying that, but I'm done. I told him the situation. DDP's like, listen, give me a call. Uh, give me a call tomorrow. I gave him a call. So that was Monday. So now it's, I quit Sunday. Monday, I meet, I meet DDP at the airport. Tuesday, I have a ticket for fucking, I have a ticket to fly to Atlanta to meet with Eric Bischoff. Wednesday I leave so I quit Sunday by Wednesday I had a job for 250000 a year um, like within like 72 hours wow. and sat home for six months making five grand a week September 9th oh here's one so I, I'll give you I remember this date September 9th they sent me a $10,000 signing bonus then they made they sent me to they'd make me go piss at some place I was living in I was on my I was on the ocean in my house and uh Clearwater. I had to go piss fucking at some like hospital thing there that they had set up. Then I sit home till March like 6th and get paid five grand a week to sit home and do nothing. They started. So the first thing they did, I was going to come in with Raven. I was going to come in with Raven and they were going to do something, but it was a little convoluted or whatever. And then luckily Nash gets the book. Nash gets the book on fucking that uh, on like Sunday. Let's somewhere like in March, first first week in March. Nash gets the book. JJ Dillon calls me uh, like um, the same day that Nash gets the book and says, "We want you at Raw Monday night." Uh, not Raw, whatever the Nitro, fuck they're doing. Yeah. So I had to go into Minnesota. I, we were it was in St. Paul or whatever, whatever the fuck it was. And uh, and he said, "Oh," and he said, "Um, bring uh, bring your bring your stick." Uh, but I was well, I didn't have my stick in this uh, in the things that the, we shot some vignettes with Raven at this um at this house that they rented out with a pool and shit like that. And me and him were playing chess and I, it was just stupid. I didn't like it, but you know they're paying me five grand a week. I'll freaking suck their fucking dick if they want me to. That's my <laughs> psychology, day, you know what I mean? Fuck. I, mean, I just, just made one hundred twenty five thousand dollars and did nothing. So um. So I hated that. So I go into freaking um so I oh so I'm in Minnesota, I'm the first person in the freaking locker room. Next person in the locker room, Sting. I introduce myself to Sting. He pulls out some cards, starts shuffling. And Sting, Sting's like the best freaking uh sp uh, was it spade? Whatever the fuck game we were playing, like uh, a rummy or whatever. Well, I've been guard rummy or something. I know how to play kind of cards, but I mean I I'm not interested in that game. But I play him anyway and I kill him. I kill him myself. So Sting hates me right away because everybody's coming into the locker room now and they're seeing me beat Sting and freaking cards. And he's like one of the best dudes. So I'm sure he wasn't happy about that. So then we go into freaking like two hours later, they pull me into, um, they pull me into room. Dusty Rhodes is in there. Uh, Nash is in there. Bischoff's in there. And a couple, like a couple, couple lackeys. Dusty gives me the barbed wire right then. And I'm like, oh, nice. He goes, no, yeah, I wish I could talk, do a, a Dusty imitation. And he's like, listen, he's like, oh, no, feel it. And it was rubber. So those barbs were rubber. It was all, I've never used fake barbed wire. Anything I else did was, was real barbed wire. Yeah, but that was fake barbed wire he gave me. And I'm like, oh, Dusty, you're the freaking best, dude. And then, um, so then they're like, well, you can't use the Sandman name. I'm like, what? I said, dude, I own the Sandman name. I can prove, you guys know this. I've proven that I've owned it. Yeah, but we're worried about getting sued. This is what the fuck this little dweeb tells me. Their lawyer or whatever. I, you know, little dweeb. The guy's probably a hot shot lawyer making like a million a year. 
He's telling me, well, we're worried about getting sued from a Sandman Concrete Company in California. Sandman Concrete. I'm like, dude, I am a wrestler. I am not them. It's a totally different thing. Lost my argument. So they're like, well, what are we going to do? Well, well, what do you want to do? I don't know. Whatever happened, I'm like, listen, why don't I just go out there and grab the microphone and call Bigelow out? And you guys don't call me anything like I took over the show. They're like, all right. They like that. That was my idea. And uh, so then the next week, I'm sitting in the freaking hallway. Nash comes walking. He's like, he's like, dude, they're not going to let you freaking use the same man. What do you want to be called? I said, call me Hack then. Because I've had that name Hack. All my kids call me. My parents call me. That's been like my nickname since I've been five years old. My older brother gave it to me. So then that's how I came up with Hack, literally in a 30-second conversation with Nash and all that. Now, they let you out of your contract, I guess, after a year. It was supposed to be three years. Was that just... And still and paid me the rest. Oh, you got, you were paid? Dude, I was making five grand a week with them. Because remember, the company went under yeah. less than six months later. They yeah. were trimming, fucking fired everybody. I mean, I probably deserved to be fired anyway. Oh, yeah, because they didn't think I hurt my neck in that junkyard match, which was bullshit. I was hurt. Everybody got hurt in that match. What fucking way. idiots, them dudes. They're just even me and Mikey were fucking on top. Like, we're on the stack of, like, four cars, dude. The helicopter's over top of us. And me and him are just cracking the fuck up, thinking that literally I'm late laughing fucking hard that just the, just the whole scene and everything it was just ridiculous that fucking junk hair match i was supposed to win that and but i showed up late for whatever fucking reason and in the last minute they switched it over to, to fifth finley and then there's your karma for you fifth finley gets a gash in his leg like freaking and ended up suing him the next night because the fits fits not a hardcore dude Fit's a worker, dude. Fit, fit will work your freaking by seeing him work freaking, what's his name? Oh, these guys. Re, Steven Regal and Fit Finley, I seen him work a pinky for freaking 20 minutes and get it over. A, a pinky. Fit, watch, watch those guys, dude. Fit will take one, maybe two bumps a match. Same with Regal, dude. They're freaking great, great, great workers, dude. They're, they're, you know, Fit didn't need to be in a hardcore match. And I'm not sure when this happened, but Rob told me to ask you about the story in Minnesota with the taxi driver and Steve Carino. Do you have any recollection? Was it? A, I don't know. It could have been. A, it could have been like a Habib taxi driver back then, a guy wearing a turban, and I knew where I was going. And this guy was trying to take us to the wrong place. Francine's in the back. Joel Gertner's in the back. Maybe uh, I didn't even think Carino was there. Okay, yeah. So I noticed Habib's trying to make money out of us, and um. So, so he's taking him, taking me away that I didn't that I didn't want to go. I wanted him to go. I wanted him to go another way. So, so I start fucking. I'm like, no, dude. I start yelling at this dude. So this dude, and I'm not paying attention to where he's driving now, but he circles back. <laughs> He circles back and, and goes back through the airport and he goes near all the where the rest of the taxi where the rest of the Habib taxi guys are. And it was too it was crazy. It was like I was in Egypt and they were all like yelling at us and, and shit like that. And meanwhile, and so a cop, a, a cop there was there was something to do with the police officer was right there because you know it's airports, there's cops fucking everywhere. So I'm pulling all my drugs out, like throwing them in the back seat. I got coke, dude. I got cocaine on me there. I got pot on me. I got a bunch of pills on me. You know what I mean? So I'm throwing all that stuff to free and seat in the back. She's like uh, hiding shit everywhere. And then, um, and then I, I, they, they switched this out of the thing. But the cop was on my side because the cop, these guys were known for doing shit like that. You know what I mean? Taking you on a roundabout loop. You know what I mean? So the cop's like, yeah, God, let's get you another taxi. Get the fuck out of here. Now, you ended up going back to ECW. Did you ever have any problems with your pay when you went back? All right, here we go. Funny. So now, that you want to keep secrets? Nobody knew that I was coming back to ECW. Because one, you're not supposed to because you got a 90-day non-compete, which I didn't, even, I didn't care about their 90-day non-compete. I knew the company was going under. I figured, I figured I could at least get that by and get paid for 90 days. And um, so nobody knew I was coming back. And... Um, and yeah, I don't, Paul didn't miss much with me, but, but see, but other, I, I was in, I was in a different position because I always made money out to Kevin Sullivan told me that one day he goes, he's like, hack, oh, before he left to take the book in WCW and he put Nancy with me. That was his last act of like being the booker in ECW was putting me and Nancy together. 
And he goes, dude, he goes, you're smart. He goes, you're, you're a heel. You could lose every night and get over more than the guy that just beat you. And you make money besides being in this business, dude. You got promoter. You'll have promoters by the balls. And I'm like, I, I really took that took that to heart. You know what I mean? But so, yeah, I was in it too because a lot of other guys were, you know, were, were living off of the wrestling income. You know what I mean? But it wasn't as, the income wasn't as super important. But I mean, man, he might, might have been like 20 G's or something like that. But it wasn't like, like well, I think Rob and Sabu got got hurt for more. So you went to WWE shortly after uh, ECW closed. Who was the one that? Dude, I'm sitting in my house. Dreamer calls me, and I'm oh, I was going out. Just I'm 44, I think. Then I was oh, I moved in this 22 year old gorgeous blonde Rachel with me. Um, Ty, I, I thought he was lying. I'm like, Dream, we're gonna get the fuck out of here. And uh, he goes, No, dude, we're gonna start something with Vince. I was like shocked. And then I had to be somewhere in the next in the next couple days. I think that was probably a Sunday, and probably had to be somewhere Monday. Wow. So, what was your uh, high point of working back for WWE? I don't. Uh, I don't know. I guess the high point was probably. Uh, I guess there's two, like maybe WrestleMania, if you look at it from uh, like, you know, just being in the freaking stadium wrestling in front of 83,000 people or whatever is like, like insane like that. But I guess Sandman's high point in the company would probably be uh, wrestling the big show for the hardcore belt. How was he to work with? Dude, I know that I, I had to know another place not too far from here. Um, uh, my first wife uh, used to work at this used to be a stripper at this strip club so I go down there but I met Big Show Big Show was a huge Sandman fan and, and and every time I was there he would try and get me to train him but I'm like dude I'm on the road too much and then I got another business going I'm like I'm sorry and I'm fucking stupid I probably if, I, if a big dude like that would come to me now I'd be like yeah come live with me dude I'll take care of you you know what I'm saying freaking I'll make you a superstar and, you'll, and then you'll support me for the rest of my life. But yeah, the big show wanted me to train him. And, um, and so we would hang out at the strip club together. He was the head freaking bouncer. Oh, I probably met him through the pitbulls. And, um, and so me and him, were, me and him had, known, had known each other for a while until we met up in, uh, in, uh, and don't in, in for Vince at that point and he was cool he was hurt that night his back was killing him I'm like dude I you know we didn't have to talk much I went, oh actually we're, he was in his bus because he traveled in a bus um not like a car he had a big ass like 40 foot bus with the bed in the back and everything went in there he, we were smoking a joint together I'm like dude what do you want to do tonight he's like dude my back's fucking killing me I'm like we're good you hit me with your finish when the time's right he's like okay so all I made him do in the match was uh chop me uh, he did the he did his two two moves. He took a bump on, but he chopped me like five, six, seven times. And I would be like, "Chop me!" He goes, "No, he's pushing me back." He's like, "No, I don't want to." I said, "Chop me!" What else are you gonna do? Your back's killing me. He's like, "Oh yeah, boom!" I'd sell that for 30, 40 seconds, roll around the ring, and we just did nothing. He he got color for me, which wasn't I had no idea what, that he was gonna get color. So yeah, it was like, it was just nice and easy. What did you think about the whole WWE version of ECW? Okay, dude, I I, I thought of, I didn't I didn't have any preconceived notions because I knew it was going to be a fuck in the end anyway. You know what I mean? So I'm just like I'm here for the paycheck, dude. And, and the pay the, that's the only, that was the only good thing about being in that company was the paycheck. And then once they started, they oh, and then once they moved me to Raw, I started asking for my release anyway because I didn't want to be on Raw. I hated that locker room. I had no friends with. I had none of my ECW guys with me. And, um, I, and I hated being on Raw. But they put me in a good spot with Carlito, the cane on the pole, and we were going to go somewhere to him. But I don't know. It just that, that locker room sucked fucking being there. Everybody's like walking on bids and needles. You can't trust what anybody's saying. Everybody walks around scared. It's freaking horrible. How was the pay there? Because Justin Credible told me it wasn't that great in WWE. Well, not, well maybe not what he was getting paid, but I was, I was getting paid good. Wow. Yeah, I probably did like, I, oh, I did two, I did two hundred, I did two hundred that year and work like fucking ten times. Did me, uh, not, and then the next year, did you get seventy five thousand for the video game? I got forty thousand dollars from WrestleMania. Eight, I did two moves for forty thousand dollars. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, money was fine.
And you've said Chris Candido has been one of your favorite people uh, in ECW. Uh, is that true? Well, yeah, dude. Chris was, dude. Chris was the night. I, you know, everybody says like if you go to a funeral or something, you're like, oh, he was such a nice dude. Chris was the fucking nicest dude, genuine nicest guy in the freaking world. Too bad he got fucked. Damn, he just fucked him up. But um. But yeah, Chris was great, and the, be the best thing about Chris was, because he, he, Chris had been to WrestleManias already and shit like that, you know what I mean? So by the time he got there, he had been around the block before, and he would just, all he cared about, he would go in the ring and try and pop the guys in the locker room that are watching the freaking match, doing his little, doing just anything to make us laugh, it was great. And what did you think of Tammy and your own personal experiences? Yeah, the, the, dude, I don't like to. If, if, uh, I don't like to say a lot of bad shit about people, but nah, she was the shits. She was horrible. And, and everybody knows anything I could say isn't something that's been said already. How did you like your time in TNA? You had several stints there. TNA sucked, fucking. I mean, it was good because I got to spend time. I spent a lot of time with the devil there. Uh, Jim, I don't know his name. Remember the devil from ECW? Oh, the yeah. red guy I called him. Uh, Jim yeah. something. James Mitchell. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, I got to, used to spend freaking... Uh, um, I used to get to spend the night with him partying freaking every Wednesday night. But... Um, Nah, uh, TNA sucked. You know, Jeff Jarrett was freaking running. You know how Jeff is. You know, listen. The first day they bring me in, right? Uh, me, was that the first? Maybe not the first. Th that was the first day. But they did a faction with us, with me, Perry, New Jack, and something like that. You're gonna love this. So, Jeff Jarrett gets in the ring and he get he. They're gonna do an an end of. They're gonna do whatever his whatever the TNA faction against our faction. So this is what Jeff's booking comes up with to start our program. This is what Jeff wants to do. We, somehow we interfere on his match. Dude, he's not even part of the other faction that he wants us to work with. But as his booking goes, in which I can't understand why any booker would think of even considering this. We're bringing in this badass ECW, the badass ECW faction. The first thing he wants to do is have us four come out to the ring and him beat all four of us up. That's what he wanted to do. Me, New Jack, you remember I was telling you about those little pauses and the looks? We're just standing there. It's like, is this fucking dude serious? And we're all like, no, nah, we're not doing that. He's like, what do you mean? He's like, dude, I, I'm, I'm telling him right to his face. I'm like, dude, you're going to bring us in here as this big badass faction, and you're going to beat all four of us up, and then you're going to turn us with your four guys? I said, no, dude, n no, I have no problem just leaving. You don't even have to pay me, dude. We started to get out of the ring. Next thing you know, 20 minutes later, Vince, Vince Russo changed it. Okay. I forget what he changed it to, but it wasn't fun. He didn't beat us up. How did you get along with Vince Russo? Great. Vince, Vince very cool guy. What did you think about Dixie Carter? Great. Love Dixie. She liked me too. Me and her got along great. She's super nice. Excellent. And you were also in XPW for a while. All right. Which, oh, dude, when New Jack tasered freaking what's his name oh dude that was the Are biggest you were there for that yeah it was in the build dude that you think shane mcmahon's a badass jump out dude i love shane entertains the shit out of me the only in fact the mcmahon's are the only thing on that show that would that has entertained me in the last freaking years um but um that's nothing what shane did off the cage whatever that was into a big uh, into a big freaking air mat no that that's that's not nothing that's cool but what vic did was fell for maybe even higher than that threw some tables onto a wrestling mat dude that was on i was just like holy shit dude it was high uh, and he didn't get hurt the dude fell almost missed the ring Almost, he might have hit the ropes or something. But, dude, he was a tank, dude. That dude was just solid. And, dude, I couldn't believe he didn't get hurt from that. What do you think about New Jack? I love him. Yeah, New Jack was great, dude. <laughs> yeah, dude, the crazier the better as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> were you at, I guess you were at ECW One Night Stand when uh, JBL attacked the Blue Meanie? Uh, yeah, and... and I'm, I'm not so sure exactly what happened. I just know that I ended up, if you go from Meanie's, from Meanie's version, 
I remember him saying stuff like, oh, and Sandman being the man that he is, got behind JBL and got him out of there. I had no idea what was going on with Amini and JBL. I just knew it was time to go. I'm looking around. I'm working with, I forget who I was doing something with over here. But I turn around and JBL is the only one left in the ring. I go up, I get behind him, I pull him down. I'm like, hey, you ready to go? He's like, yeah, thanks, brother. Wow. Boom, and that was it. So you I had no idea what was going on with Meanie, but Meanie thinks that I saw it and I saved him. And I told him this. I said, "Me, I said, I didn't freak. I, I love the Meanie and it, and it, and the Blue Girl, his girlfriend. They're they're just great people. You know what I mean? And um, yeah. But I told him I was like, dude, I had no idea what was going on there. Did you ever have a locker room fight in your career? Me and New Jack for a second, he threw a bottle. I'm sitting here talking to Guido. I don't know what, the, what was going on. He threw a bottle at me. I went like that. The bottle freaking broke on this bone right here, shattered. Guido's got glass all over him. I got up. I grabbed New Jack, threw him, threw him, on, threw him on the ground or something, and they broke us up. But that was all that. The bottle. The, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's the only locker room competition. Except when uh, have an RVD slap Taz. A couple times. Did you ever hear that story? No, I never heard that. Taz is sitting there. Dude, I'm getting off the plane but because we were, I was, it was me, Fonzie, Sabu, and RVD traveling together. Um, we, Rob doesn't say anything to anybody, just like it's a regular day. We show up at the building. Rob walks right up to Taz sitting down, stands over top of him, and goes, pick a hand. Taz is like, what? Bam. Man, damn, slap stuff piss out of him. Taz is like, we don't know what's going on. Freaking, I know what's going on, but I don't know why it's going on, but I was entertained totally. Then Taz is like, oh, brother, 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 what happened? And he sits back down. Rob goes, pick a hand. Bam! <laughs> Cracks the shit out of him with the other hand. And then like walks away. And, and so then we find out later it's because I mean, Van Dam would kick your head off, dude. That dude, that dude's knocked me out with a couple kicks from the top rope. But I learned to freaking stay way far away from him in the ring and walk into him as he's coming. Don't let him extend on you. So, um, so Taz was talking shit to somebody, and Van Dam found it. Taz is like, "Oh, that Van Dam kicks me in the face again. I'm gonna fuck him up or something." Van Dam finally got tired of Taz saying that, so he just went in there and bitch slapped him in front of everybody. So the Taz tough guy image uh, is, is uh, legit. Well, it was done. It was probably a little bit done before that. Because Bubba, there was an incident with Bubba and Taz too. Because Taz trained all those guys like Bubba, freaking um, um, Danny Doreen, Chris Shetty. Those guys, they were part of Taz, Team Taz or whatever. You know what I mean? And Taz was just a prick to him. You know that hard ass like trainer type of dude. You know what I'm saying? What was the Captain Lou Albano incident? Oh, it's drunk at his 75th birthday. The owner of the... Oh, my God. That dude threw a beer bottle at me and hit me right on the hit me right on the forehead. Shattered. I chased him into the kitchen. I don't remember any of this. Oh, I know. Jimmy, what the heck is that kid's name? He was in the kitchen. And I, came, I was in the kitchen. I was picking up freaking shit, throwing trays of glasses around. I found this big... I don't... I don't this is the only part I remember. There was a, one of these super oversized... Uh, salt and pepper shakers so I so I grabbed the salt and pepper shaker and I'm looking for the dude who just hit me who just threw a bottle I mean shattered it on my forehead and I'm gushing blood and I open up a door and I found him I go to hit him and the SWAT team comes in pointing guns at me fucking straight SWAT team dude now what's this suitcase full of coke uh, locker room story a suitcase full of coke ECW. I don't know about a, a suitcase. Well, if there was Coke, it was probably brought in by us. But, you know, come me and a couple of my boys, because, you know, we were Coke dudes. But I don't know anything about a suitcase of Coke. Who would be the biggest partier next to you in the Me and New Jack. You and New Jack. New Jack didn't even drink. I was the first one sent to meet him. I met him and Mustafa get out of the car. And, oh, my God. That fucking hotel is like freaking half a mile from here. Freaking, I was the first one to meet him, you know what I mean? And Jack doesn't know what the specs are. He, he came off as a badass, and I respected him as a badass, too, you know what I mean? So I'm like, oh, this guy's going to be fucking great for this company, you know what I mean? Yeah. So we became friends, but he didn't even drink when he started here. And the next thing you know, like two years later, it's fucking yard out, dude. Who would you say you hate the most in the wrestling business? No, eh, nobody. I don't, I don't really have it. I have like a hate, you know what I'm saying? I, yeah, dude, I got lucky in most of my experiences. 
You had that uh, incident with the ECW zombie. Uh, he ended up killing himself, unfortunately. Do you think... Ter what was his name? Um, Tim. Oh, Tim was great, dude. I liked him a lot. He was a real nice guy. That, another screw-up. It wasn't... You know what it was supposed to be? It wasn't supposed to be the zombie. That got changed to, like an hour before the show. It was going to be an, a green alien. Really? Because we were starting on sci-fi. Yeah. It was going to be... They didn't know... I didn't... So I don't even know, dude. I just did... Uh, I'm just like in my own world. I'm not... I'm straight them because you can't be shit face walking around like I used to so you got to be straight for fucking for when you're in Vince's locker room and just this just the stuff that you would see I'm like are you seriously going to do this are you seriously going to do this like just some of the stuff it's like it's like it's like crazy to me um so yeah so with sci-fi it was going to be a freaking it was going to be a green alien that I was going to cane and then they came up with a zombie like late and are, you, oh. are you still partying Oh, no, dude, not like the way I used to, shit. I don't even drink beer anymore. Dude, I got done after I figured out, like, after you drink, like, 30, 40,000 beers, dude, done. Done, just drink vodka now. What would you say the best match of your career was? None. I don't know. Freaking, I don't know the best one. I don't, I don't, I don't think about it like that. Can you actually wrestle like you? Dude, I know all the moves, like the chain, like, like all, all that. I know, I just don't know the names of them. Okay. You know what I mean? But yeah, I can do all that stuff. Dude, I got trained well by dude Larry Winters. We didn't take a bump for the first you didn't take a bump for the first two months, two and a half months, dude. You learned how to chain wrestle, stand in like all the switches and stuff. And do you have any uh, social media where fans I don't, follow? I don't know nothing. You keep to yourself. Yeah. I draw I lost my I only had Twitter. Yeah. And uh I was I was using Twitter, but I'm sitting in my son's house. Uh, I gotta I gotta take a shit at my son's house, right? I get up off the freaking toilet. I was doing something with my phone. I, now imagine this. You just took a shit in this toilet, right? But your whole world just fell in that toilet. So literally for like, it felt like an hour and a half. I'm like, oh my God, do I put my hand in there to get it? Do I not? Do I do it? But I do it real quick. Boom. I take the phone out. I do that rice thing. I stick it. Um, I wash it off a little bit. Then I stick it in the bag with rice. So then everything everything came back good, but I, but I couldn't put my my speaker thing was screwed up so I, it was like an iphone 5 literally and, and and that was like last december so then when i was starting and i never backed it up the whole time i had it in fact it stopped at 250 weeks it stops telling you that it's not backing you up any that you that you never backed it up so um so i do that and then when i go to get a new one which i don't even know what number this one is but when they went to change some of the information i lost my my control of my twitter and then i just never took it back because i couldn't because i had one of my my son's girlfriends set it up for me because i'm clueless when it comes to stuff like that and um and i just couldn't get it back and i never I never got around to even getting it back mostly it was shit of like me and my sons playing golf or cooking or something and last question, overall thoughts of Paul Heyman. Love him, dude. Uh, I don't care what anybody says about the dude. Well, he's, you know what it is? My, I told you my, I told you earlier my brother died around the same time that it was very, very close to our own heart. So um, I had a brother like Paul Heyman that had a very hard time telling the truth about the simplest thing. Like if he just, if he just went to the Wawa, he would tell you he, was, he went to Walmart. It's just, I don't know. It's just, there was something in their brains. But but both of them were brilliant. And Paul, I mean, Paul's, to me, he's got to be the best booker literally ever in his business. I mean, the guy's like super genius when it comes to wrestling. You know what I mean? So, and yeah, I, yeah, I didn't make every single solitary dime. Like I told you, maybe I, uh, he might've missed like 10 or 20 grand on me or something like that. I'd have paid another 50 just to, dude, I wouldn't be me if it wasn't for Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman, his first day in the ECW locker room said, you're, get, you're getting rid of that surfboard today. So I got it. I got an X-Acto knife and I put a big cut in and I had the rebel break it over my head in the ring uh, that night. So if it wasn't for Paul Heyman, I, I wouldn't be the same man. Well, thanks a lot for doing this interview. Anything to say to close this off? Peace, I'm out.